Hello, my name is Vanessa de Oliveira Andreotti, and I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair in Race Inequalities and Global Change at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Um, today, unfortunately, I cannot be with you. Um, I apologize. There was a medical emergency in the family, and I had to cancel my trip to San Francisco. Uh, therefore, you're going to hear from me through this uh, video, which is being recorded uh, from my home at the uh, Musqueam Indigenous Community, which is uh, adjacent to the University of British Columbia, which is also located on Indigenous land, Musqueam Indigenous land, and this is important to acknowledge. So today I'm going to talk about the three brilliant papers a little bit and then relate them to the work of the Decolonial Futures Collective, which is the collective that I am part of. It's an international collective um, that is discussing some of the issues related to the papers. And then I'm going to finish by posing a few pedagogical questions related to what the papers intend to do. So uh, to get us started, I would like to say that I was delighted to, he to, to read the papers, uh, especially in this educational context that we are all part of that forces us to decomplexify stuff, make things simple and that, um, uh, or practical, right? And that um, is becoming more and more anti-intellectual. So uh, it was a a breath of fresh air <laughs> to be able to spend time with uh, with scholarship that shows rigor and depth in trying to trace and understand uh, violent patterns that are normalized and naturalized in our educational practices. So thank you for all of you for um, for your work. And uh, maybe I should acknowledge, too, the work of Tom Popkiewicz that I see coming through the papers <laughs> and um, his guidance and eldership, right? It's important to honor, to honor that. So thank you, Tom, if you're there. <laughs> if you're not, please, uh, please send him uh, my regards. So... Uh, the papers. The three papers trace the costs and the violences, uh, the colonial and colonizing affinities, as one of the paper puts it, involved in the normalization and naturalization of the cognitive affective dimensions of modernity coloniality, as it's expressed in seemingly benevolent modern colonial desires, entitlements, and archetypes that generate and secure the authority of educational expertise, also as one of the paper, the papers have uh, has mentioned. So the papers did a brilliant job in denaturalizing the ubiquity of uh, a few archetypes with a view to destabilizing the assumption of harmlessness associated with them in education, which is the civilizing promise of domesticity in the education of girls, as one of the papers uh, has focused on, uh, the mobilization of curiosity in mapping and controlling borders, and growth in the discovery of self and the world, as another paper has uh, shown, and in the effective engineering that manifests in the targeting of the mind of the learner or the child as a site for educational reform in STEM and in STEAM. So um, these are all extremely important uh, analyses that uh, put on the table um, how the coloniality of uh, education uh, tends to be invisibilized uh, and become uh, a trope for development that has this celebratory, self-congratulatory <laughs> and... Um, uh, paternalistic um, uh, flavor to it and architecture, right? But that very few people um, are ready to engage with or or to notice because uh, doing that would would uh, undermine the the very 
industry <laughs> of development and of, of education as we know it. So in order to go a little bit deeper in the, in the difficulties that we have in presenting these critiques, what I would like to do um, is to talk a little bit about the work of the Gesturing Towards the Colonial Futures Collective. I'll just introduce it to you so that we can relate what I saw in the papers to some of the discussions that are happening in the collective. Okay, so the um, Gesturing Towards the Colonial Future collective, Futures Collective is a collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, and activists doing research and scholarship in artistic, pedagogical, and cartographic experiments. Uh, it's trying to bring together concerns related to racism, colonialism, and sustainability and climate change. Uh, we work uh, with three forms of denial, the denial of violence, uh, constitutive violence of modernity, the denial of unsustainability, the idea that this is not going to continue in, indeterminately, and the denial of entanglement. Uh, so we see separability as foundational to colonialism. Uh, so we don't start with the analysis just of so subjugation of people. We start with uh, the separation of people in land or people in cosmos, uh, which is uh, uh, an indigenous influence. And... Um, and therefore, we focus a lot on, on the denial of our uh, constitutive entanglement as one of, of the major problems that we face as we address uh, uh, colonialism and coloniality towards possibilities for decoloniality. And we say that we are gesturing towards because we acknowledge our complicity in colonial systems, colonial systems underwrite our existence and make it possible for us to be talking today. Uh, so the idea of gesturing is a is a way of reminding us that decoloniality is impossible for us who are subsidized by by um, the colonial apparatus of modernity. So we also attempt to mobilize a decolonial psychoanalytic slash psychoaffective pedagogy of interruptions and exiled capacities. So this is not the topic of today, but if you're interested, then um, please send me an email. I can talk about it. It's, um, it's been a very interesting conversation to, um, to try to imagine what um, psychoanalysis that does not focus on the human body would um, would be about and um, working with indigenous communities that um, that have that kind of psychoanalysis but untranslated into uh, modern frames of reference has been a very interesting journey. And lastly, um, these, the work of the collective is inspired by post-colonial, decolonial, critical race theory and indigenous studies, um, literatures, and the work that we have with communities in high-intensity struggle, um, mostly in Latin America, but also uh, here in Canada. So this is just an overview of the collective, and I use it to present one of the cartographies that we have that is related uh, to the three papers. And um, I will introduce you to um, a figure, which is called Boxhead, uh, representing a modern colonial grammar of reasoning that is marked by dialectical, utility-maximizing, logocentric, evolutionary, Cartesian, teleological, or chronic, and anthropocentric thinking. So in the middle, in the middle of it, you say, I think, therefore I am. I say, if, I say, therefore it is. I can, therefore I will. I rock, therefore you suck. And underneath it, you have um, forces that interrupt the drawing of this box, which are the erotic, the aesthetic, the intuitive, the ludic, the divine, the hilaric, hilarious, and the other than human. We are we have more that we're including, including uh, now probably also because of what I'm going through in the family. We are saying that the, this is also interrupts. Um, this line and forces you into uh, into different states and and uh, into the experimentations of uh, other ways of being, but most importantly for this uh, figure boxhead, uh, the ontology, the ontometaphysics of boxhead, is one where being is reduced to knowing, and. This being reduced knowing also uh, focuses a lot on meaning. So whatever 
um, it is that is not codified uh, may become in, in, in the grammar that is available to Boxhead uh, um, becomes unintelligible and it needs to remain outside of the realms of intellig intelligibility of the box. So this problematizes a little bit the idea of voice and representation of other ways of being because um, it focuses on the fact that for these ways of being to become uh, legible and thinkable, they need to be already translated into a very different onto epistemology. So there's a, a very, very good article by Kesha Henneke called Grafting um, Indigenous Ways of Knowing onto Non-Indigenous Ways of Being that can, um, can help us think through the problems of, of representation um, and legibility in that sense. But important for our discussion today is that uh, the, the modern colonial grammar of reasoning is uh, grounded on an affective grammar as well, which we call uh, modern colonial desires and modern colonial entitlements. So this is one of the maps we had uh, been working on uh, in, for the past, we have been working on it for the past month, more or less, and we tried to map um, the desire for admiration, arbitration, affirmation, and authority in the archetypes of the hero, the warrior, the savior, the judge, the knower, the righteous, the guru, the chosen, the carer, the leader, the problem solver, and the change maker. So these are all archetypes that we find very uh, commonly uh, as we're working um, through these issues with um, um, educational communities and also NGO communities, right? So in the, the four archetypes, uh, the, the four archetypes, the many archetypes and the four desires that we've mapped, what we see is a very strong tendency of consumption. It's a drive of consumption, not only of consumption of stuff, but of consumption of knowledge, relationships, and experiences. So the mode of relationality of Boxhead to the world is one uh, where, where Boxhead consumes the word, the world, and the word, right? And um, what we're trying to do is, is issue a different invitation. But another important part of uh, the desire, the, how the desires manifest um, in education, uh, is the fact that they manifest as an entitlement. And what we, we uh, mapped uh, in relation to the context where we're working is that the entitlement for unrestricted autonomy is one um, that comes uh, very strongly uh, in the communities we work with. So the tropes uh, or archetypes of the innocent, the virtuous, and the deserving um, uh, become very important. So in that sense, for example, when you talk about entanglement, people want to be entangled with the whales, the flowers, the sun, and the moon, <laughs> but they really don't want to look at how they're also entangled with a lot of shit. So we put the shit on the other side. There's collective and individual shit that needs to be composted that is separated by a wall that sanitizes the space for unrestricted autonomy. So we've been trying to deal with um, how to sensitize people to the fact that we will need to compost shit together, that we will need um, to, uh, what we say, uh, it's a shit composting party, so that um, we can, shit, like shit can become soil or fertilizer. For, for other things to grow, but that entanglement involves entanglement with wonderful things and also terrible things, and it involves taking a different form of responsibility for our complicit, complicity and implication and violence and harm. So in reading the papers, I, I saw a lot of connections, so I used the papers to redraw some of the... Um, some of the tropes, and I'm going to show you what I came up with that um, I think is my way of honoring uh, what I read and, and mobilizing it uh, in a pedagogical way. So 
in uh, Johanna's paper and Ryan's paper, I saw a lot of the affirmation of, of Boxhead's right to separability. Um, and um, the archetypes would be the curious and brave explorer, the motivated and adaptive collaborator, the creative and passionate problem solver, the inquisitive and self-regulated learner, and the globally aware and empathetic citizen. So thank you so much for bringing this uh, to the table. I'm definitely going to use this cartography um, with, with some communities that I, I work with. This, is, this will make a lot of sense. And um, in the paper about the girl, I found something that um, in, in the collective we hadn't discussed yet, but that is extremely important. So... Um, I drew the box family, which is a, a nuclear family with box head. Now, um, we have also box heart head and box screen head as the child there. And um, focusing on uh, the role of um, this trope of the women uh, in this family and the role of women in a nuclear family. We have uh, the archetypes of the super mama, the hygiene champion, the homemaker, the entrepreneur, the community builder, the ferocious social mobility chooser, which is then uh, translated as uh, the role of the civilizer and the improver of racial, racial stocks. And um, reflecting on this uh, on many different levels, this was such a... Um, a gap, uh, I think, in the in the the work that we were doing, that um, God is thinking about um, in in a feminized prof profession like education, and also um, in development, right? With, with when we're talking about international development and NGOs, it's also uh, largely feminized, especially uh, the front line of the work. Um, how uh, this ethnocentric paternalistic projections of, of, of how this trope works in the so-called global north in relation to the global south, how it operates in a way that we use other bodies in the south as consumption again to, to build autonomy. Uh, the work of Cook here in Canada. Uh, she was looking at Pakistan and international development work in Pakistan and how women from Canada felt really disempowered in their communities and decided to go to Pakistan to be able to, to feel uh, more autonomous and empowered. And how um, the consumption of uh, this benevolence towards the other uh, becomes a consumption of the bodies of other people for your own self-actualization and for your own benefit, right? So, again, thank you so much for um, uh, offering the opportunity for this kind of engagement. This is uh, in my attempt to, to mobilize this pedagogically so that it can be used within the collective that I belong to. And uh, I would like to finish with a few questions that we've been discussing in the collective that might or not be useful for the kind of work that you're trying to do with the papers. So here they go. Uh, they are about the difficulties and paradoxes of interrupting modern colonial tropes. And uh, so there are four points. The first one is that if the problem of unintelligibility or abyssal uh, thinking is one of the, the most difficult problems that we have, how do we tap the unthinkable and unimaginable through education? So if Boxhead has its uh, marked grammar that necessarily excludes what is not legible or thinkable, how do we um, make it possible for people to imagine otherwise? The second point is that if uh, what we're facing is not a problem of knowing that is epistemological, but of an inherently violent habit of being, which is ontological, or onto metaphysical, how do we address denial rather than ignorance in this um, in this trope? So, it's not if this is not about a lack of information, but uh, a problem of effective investments that deny the violence, that deny the unsustainability, and deny entanglement. How should the pedagogy change 
uh, to address denial rather than ignorance. And that is also um, important for us to think about critique. If critique is, the, uh, is not sufficient, right, uh, to rearrange desires, what is the role of critique and how can it be done more effectively? The third point is about effective investments. And if these effective investments are tied, of box head, are tied to an addictive neurobiological feedback loop of fears becoming compensatory desires and attachments and then becoming perceived entitlements, when will we as a society be ready for a rehab? So what will it take for us to actually say that's enough or to hit rock bottom, so to speak? And the last thing is that if people come to education to consume, consume knowledge, experiences, credentials, validations, or consume the world, how can this be interrupted so that we can issue an invitation for the world to be encountered as a living, wider, entangled metabolism that contains us all within it? So I hope you have a great discussion. Thank you so much again for inviting me to be a discussant. And I hope to hear about, um, about your work and about um, how the discussion went soon. Thank you.